from the city of brotherly love, Philadelphia to around the globe. You're listening to Shark Bite Biz, your exclusive place for business strategy, sales, marketing, and tech in the roaring 20s. And now, here's your host, David Strausser. Welcome to the newest episode of Shark Bite Biz. I'm your rock star host, David Strausser, and this is your place to learn how to grow a business during complete chaos. We got an amazing episode book for you all today. I can't wait to chat about it because it's marketing. We love marketing and it is so, so important right now during this pandemic. First though, remember, if you're watching us on YouTube, you can join the channel for only $3 a month. Yeah, $3 a month. You can become a baby shark. Now, if donating money through big tech isn't your thing, no need to worry. You can go to dead housecoffee.com use code shark you will get 20 percent off of your order and all the proceeds directly support this channel creating the biggest best show we possibly can now let's get back to today's show we're going to be talking all the good stuff in marketing today not the glitzy stuff like the you know awesome viral videos that you're going to produce on youtube no 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 We're going to be talking the nuts and bolts type of things, you know, the analytical data type stuff. We're going to be talking about conversion optimization, A-B test, and, uh, you know, some favorite e-commerce analytic tools, as well as everybody's favorite analytical program. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, Google Analytics. So who is today's guest? None other, all the way from Spain, yours, Byron. Yuris Byron is the founder and CEO of Dexter Agency, a remote team of e-commerce, conversion, optimization, and email marketing specialists. The agency serves high-revenue e-commerce stores that are ready for continuous growth. With over 1,500 A-B tests under his belt, Yuris wrote the book, Kill Your Conversion Killers, to help all the online stores he hasn't worked with yet. <laughs> Without further ado, let's bring Yoris on in. Reach your customer. Yoris, welcome to Shark Bite Biz. You, my friend, even though you're out there in Spain, you just became Shark Bait. <laughs> All right. Great to hear you. Be, be here, David. Sorry, uh, I was just stumbling just yeah. from your presence. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I know. I, I had that effect on people. <laughs> you but, do. Anyways, you know, we have a tradition here, very first question. It's a softball question, really easy. What's your background? What's your experience? How'd you get where you're at? What's your life journey? Basically, what makes yours yours? <laughs> All right. So I've been in marketing for about 20, 20 years now. Uh, I started mm-hmm. Like, like a lot of people, like classical advertising, back at the, in the, at the time, uh, that was a logical way to go. You start working in advertising agencies. Mm-hmm. And I did that for about 10 years or so. Uh, but I kind of got fed up with it because it was, um, after a while, I, I got bored with all the discussions about make this blue, make this red, uh, make it bigger, right. make it smaller. Um, and uh, I, I, I yeah, discovered online marketing and I just went with it. I, I, I loved it, did SEO, I did um, PPC, that kind of stuff. Until one day about... Oh, I'm going years- to have, have some good stories to tell you. <laughs> I have some good real life stories, both SEO for myself and I just launched a coffee brand. And I'm going through some of this stuff right now. You're gonna be, you're gonna love this. Awesome. Uh, okay, uh, that's a teaser for later. But keep going. All right. Um, so yeah, and then at one point, uh, I believe six or seven years ago, I stumbled upon uh, uh, conversion optimization. And back in the day, conversion optimization was like uh, still a tiny discipline within digital marketing. Mm-hmm. But I totally loved it because basically everything I, I had learned over the years in uh, the classical advertising agencies. Uh, like uh, stuff about psychology, psychology, design, copywriting, uh, that all came together in uh, conversion optimization, but with the added bonus of uh, being very data-driven and Mm -hmm. uh, there's no uh, discussions anymore about make it blue, make it red, make it bigger, make it smaller. It's about let's test it and we'll see what works best. I think Um, that's one of the biggest changes that has happened with marketing over the past couple years 
is that it is more data driven. Like we've had marketing people that come on and they're like, hey, I don't really hire marketing people anymore. I hire data analysts. Mm. Is that yeah, true? Absolutely. I mean, it, it, can it, be. It, it, it can be. It can be. It really depends on what you're trying to, to achieve. And I think there's still... There's a lot of focus in, in uh, digital marketing um, uh, on data and a lot of quantitative data. But the thing I think a lot of the marketers uh, kind of forget is the qualitative stuff. It's really understanding your user and trying to understand the why and trying to get in, in, in the heads of, of users of the site. And I, I think there's not enough focus on, on that part of, of data. And that's data as well. But a lot of people tend to focus on, on the numbers part of it. Um, so, but yeah, it's, it, data is super important, obviously. Um, so, but um, yeah, maybe mm-hmm. just to, to complete my story about how, how I... Became, became me. <laughs> as, as yeah. Last. How did you and become like, you? Yeah. So um, I kind of went. You you through. can skip past about the part when you tell us about your mom and your dad and that type. Nah, of nah, stuff. Nah, let's keep yeah, it professional. Yeah. But, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Keep it further in life. <laughs> yeah. So I, I loved it so much. I just I, at that time I was working in an agency and uh, they just didn't have enough clients that were ready for conversion optimization and I was like ah. Oh, Screw this! I'm I'm just going to do this as a freelance and and start start doing it and see uh, see where it goes. And it went from freelance to an agency. And uh, how long so, ago was that? Six or seven years ago now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So six or seven years ago, and you went from kind of like, hey, let's just see what happens to being a uh, fully professional blown agency. I mean, that's yeah, that's pretty then, amazing. It was never the plan, actually, because if you'd asked me at the beginning of that journey, that particular part of the journey, I would have said, no, 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 I just want to do this myself. I, I, I like to do this stuff and, and let's just freelance and I don't want to have an agency. But then you get at a point where it's hard to say no when you get more clients asking to work with you and uh-huh. you have to make that decision. Either you say no to a client, uh-huh. but you know you can help them or you make that decision and, and to grow it into an agency. But doesn't having an agency give you a little bit more peace of mind? Because when I was working independently as a consultant, now, when I did it, I was living down in Tijuana, Mexico, and I focused on American companies bringing their products into Mexico because of back then it was NAFTA, now it's the USMCA. Um, but because of those trade agreements, plus also South America too, because a lot of people don't realize, but there's a lot of uh, free trade agreements between America and a lot of individual um, uh, South American countries as well too, or reduced tariffs, stuff like that. So I really focused on that. And when I was operating as an independent consultant, it was, it got to the point to where it was, maybe it wasn't too, it was too much for me. I don't want to admit that it was too much for me, but it was. And it actually took an intervention from one of my friends because you got to remember, I'm working 40, 50, 60 hours a week for my clients. Then to find work, I'm working another 20, 30, 40 hours a week trying to find work, bid on products, because I don't know how it was in your world, but in my world, a lot of these things were fixed. You're doing this until you do this task, or you're doing this for this set of time during our busy season, and this is your goal, this is your objective, these are the milestones you're being paid off of. So I was constantly having to look for new work. And out of happenstance, I, you know, a friend of mine was like, hey, look, I know you usually work with, you know, American companies going to Latin America, but I got a buddy of mine. He's like the top sales guy at the company that he works for. He's starting a side project. He needs a project manager. Uh, it's just U.S. based, really easy work. It's only a couple bucks, but it's that easy. I don't think you'll care. He's like, can you help me out and do it? So I did it. And then after six months of working with this guy, this guy fell in love with me. He's like, David, you're amazing, but you're killing yourself, man. You are killing yourself. Like you're working 90 hours a week 
minimum nonstop between the jobs you're doing and looking for new work. You're on a plane one day to Monterey, the next to Cabo, the next to Mexico City or Lima, Peru or Ecuador or wherever it may be. And he basically was like, uh, you know, why don't you come work for my company? I'll give you that stability and you're going to make the same amount or more money. And I did. It ended up working out for me. Is that something that you kind of went through at all? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, what you mentioned, it's it's not just doing the work for the clients, but it's also making sure that there's other projects in your pipeline. And that's the, the very difficult trade-off. And I think a lot of uh, freelancers, um, they, they um, one of the mistakes I see a lot of free, freelancers make in the beginning is they, they don't charge enough. And they think like, yeah. oh, I got 40, 40 hours a week um, to work on client work. But actually, you should kind of base your pricing out of what if I work only 20 hours on client work? Uh, and 20 hours to get new clients in. And with the 20 hours I, I charge to my clients, I should be able to uh, to make a living. And uh, I, I wish I knew that back then. Yeah, and I, I don't know why, I don't know who told me, I don't remember, but actually that was my mindset from the beginning. So I, I really took that into account. So I, I, fortunately I charged enough from the beginning. Also because of what I, what I did and well, what the agency still does is it makes our clients a lot of money. So uh, most of the clients, they don't have a problem paying the fees that I was charging, which was, I mean, it was not a ridiculous amount, but still it was enough so that I still had enough time to do my own marketing and my own sales. And I think that's a really important thing. And also oh, yeah, one of the definitely. reasons I, a lot of freelancers are tempted at some point to look for more stability and uh, switch the computer off at night and be like, oh, that's fine. Uh, got it. I got my paycheck at the end of the month and uh, it's it's totally fine. Uh, so I totally get that struggle. And I I, I, I think a lot of freelancers go through the, uh, through the same uh, process and the, the same uh, emotions uh, when, when they start out. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely, it's not... Uh... It's not the easiest trying to to find that balance, but something you said there where you were like, well, it's okay with my clients as I make them a lot of money. So when you think like that, then you've had some really big clients. I mean, like I'm looking yeah, Pioneer, for example, on your list of clients that you've worked with, you have some huge names. Do you think... I mean, do you view yourself as like their growth partner? Because if you help them grow their business, okay, because you're doing their their marketing, their SEO, stuff like that. I mean, ultimately, there's an ROI in that for you as the agency, because guess what? They're going to keep buying services and probably buy more from you because you're doing a good job. What's your yeah. thought line around that? Yeah, I think as long as you um, like 10x the investment they make in your services, mm -hmm. uh, your as an agency or a service provider, I think that's that's a very good uh, goal to have. Is try to 10x the investment clients make uh, in your services. Um, so you listen to Grant Cardone? Uh, <laughs> not, not, not exactly. I think I picked it up somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But, uh, Every yeah. time I hear 10x, I think Grant Cardone. <laughs> I, th I think it's it's just a, a number that starts make when you because we when we start an A/B testing program for our clients, for instance, um, when we start doing that, usually they're already at a certain size uh, because otherwise A/B testing doesn't make sense. But uh, if we start doing that, we actually give that gar guarantee, like we'll 10x your investment in our services uh, within a certain number of tests. And if we don't, then we keep working for free until we do. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's. Uh, yeah, but that's the thing. So you, as a service provider, I think you just have to look for ways to provide enough return for uh, for your clients because otherwise it doesn't make sense for them to pay you. Oh, yeah, exactly. It really comes down to the value. Now, you brought up something a couple, couple times there, and I want to dig a little bit deeper into that, which is A-B testing. I think most people have a general idea of what A-B testing is, but... I want to see what is your definition of Pueto pandemic world 2021 A-B testing? How would you define it? A-B testing is just <laughs> trying to find out what works best based on data. Uh, and that's, uh, that's showing version A, A, the current version, to 50% uh -huh. of your uh, audience and 50% of the uh, audience gets to see a, a different version. And then you look at the, at the data and 
Uh, that's how you figure out what works best. And in our case, we work uh, exclusively for e-commerce companies. In our case, that, that means we just look at what gets them the most number of transactions or the highest number of transactions. Um, so, but, okay, so you're saying A-B testing. Do you ever do A-B-C testing? Do you sure. always limit it just to A-B or do you do more than two? Yeah, it's, it's always uh, called A-B testing, uh, but that's short for A, B, C, D, E, and in the whole alphabet, basically. Uh, you, could, you could add as many variations as you like. The only thing that, that uh, changes is uh, you need more uh, traffic and you need more transactions to, make, to pull an A, B, C test off than uh, to pull an A, B test off. But uh, in, in theory, it's, it's perfectly doable and we do it all the time. So I, I just launched my own coffee brand. It's called Dead House Coffee. Okay. Now you yeah. might think that's a weird name for coffee, right? Dead house well, coffee. I, I think it makes sense because it kind of revitalizes you or, or yeah, right. Dead house dead. coffee, yeah. get yeah. back yeah. to life because yeah. we're playing off of the zombie theme, you know? Yep. And that has been, I've been doing, I think I've done okay with sales, but it's mostly been just from the podcast, friends, family, stuff like that. Um, enough to where for the soft launch, it was mm -hmm. kind of like, yes, people like this. This is a good idea. They like the branding that everybody that got the coffee was like, oh my God, this is so good. Big difference is, is that when you buy, even if you're buying Starbucks coffee, okay. In a bag in the store that could have been roasted and sealed months ago until yeah. you actually bought it with our coffee it is um depends if you get it ground or whole bean but regardless it's roasted it would be packaged uh ground if you're getting ground whole beans if uh it's the whole bean package shipped to you okay all within a 24-hour period so if you get your coffee two days later you're drinking coffee that is the freshest of the freshest because it's within two days of being roasted. And mm. it makes a huge difference because the reviews that we've got off of my soft launch testing has been, it, it's been amazing. And so much so that then, in, and that was just like with a generic website, I paid some dude like, hey, 200 bucks, here's the coffee, get me an e-comp site that'll work. So then I went out and I built a real website, a zombie themed website, and sales went up even more with that. But even for only being around for about three weeks, I mean, traffic to the website, I think we're doing pretty good. I mean, we're getting anywhere from 40 to maybe 150, 200 hits uh, uh, on the website a day. We mm -hmm. don't have all the we, we don't have the conversions i would like yet but it's also one of those things that it's a work on work in progress like it's not like i'm doing a lot of the seo i'm adding in a lot of the the, the descriptions i'm i'm filling in a lot of the pieces i can in my spare time because i'm bootstrapping it you know i sure. don't have unlimited money to to spend but um a new econ company like that, I'm not the only one. A lot of people, I was inspired to do it because of the show, because we had so many people that were like, hey, we only sold in stores. Now we do strictly econ, spend a lot of money on that. And we sell more in econ than we did when, you know, pre pandemic. So mm -hmm. it inspired me to kind of find something, go out, do it, have fun. And that's what I'm doing but a lot of other people are doing it too. What advice do you have for smaller companies like Dead House Coffee in order to really get their foot in the door and start getting a little bit higher of a percentage of conversions? I think uh, it's, it's probably not what you expect, but uh, I'd say start with the who, not the what. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what do I mean is... Um, develop your product around a certain niche or a certain target audience and start from there. Instead of, I sell coffee, it's more like uh, I serve this particular niche and coffee happens to be the product that serves this niche. So that's exactly what I was thinking because I'm like, hey, you take a product like coffee, coffee it, it, it's probably one of the only things I didn't actually research because 
everybody drinks coffee. That's just a known fact that the, a lot of people drink coffee. I drink 15 cups of coffee a day. So I supported the business to support my habit. <laughs> but, um, you know, so I, we, that's a known fact. So then I said, okay, what I'm going to focus in are the fun people. Either There's two types, people that love zombies, okay? Mm -hmm. Or people that um, are fun loving type people and then they see the the zombie like yeah i'm a zombie this is i'm a zombie in the morning so i drink my coffee this is me i like it that appeals to so they're the two needs because i you know again a coffee is that big of a market that i can pick out those two segments of where there's crossover and that's still millions upon millions of people yeah, absolutely. What what I would do is pick one, and there's there's going to be some spillover to the other one. So you just start with one. Let's say you go for the the, the zombie lovers, and you yeah. can go all in there because you know where they hang out. There's certain groups or forums or whatever. You know where they hang out, so it's right. easy, easy to target. Uh, you can you can you can <laughs> on the dark web. I'll be on the dark <laughs> obviously, web. <laughs> obviously, obviously, or somewhere in a coffin or something. But yeah. you can, I mean, you can you can find it more easily than going after the ones that like something funny and they're like oh yeah i'm like a zombie in the morning so I, i'd go for one and uh, automatically automatically you'll have some spillover to other niches and, and and segments as well but you have to just start with one and then you can expand that later on but that you shouldn't be worried about that right now just go all in right right go go all in on the people because you know i was talking to my mom and my mom's like well a lot of people up here you know, they're a little bit uptight. They're in small Pennsylvania, small town Pennsylvania and a little bit more conservative with that stuff. And they're like, they don't really like this zombie. And I'm like, well, mom, guess what? They're not the people I'm trying to sell to. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, the coffee yeah. market's that big that if you don't like it, you don't hurt my feelings. Plus, I mean, if I ever wanted to, it's like, okay, I already got the suppliers. I just print out an alternative label without a zombie. and. Now you're my customer. Okay, bam, easy. But I don't want yep. to do that if I don't have to. No, no, I go all in on on, on the zombie theme. I mean, it makes it easier makes it, it makes it easier to make content, for instance, as well, because uh, you you always make content with someone in mind, mm -hmm. and if you have a very clearly defined person. All the rest of your marketing is going to be so much easier. Uh, oh, so yeah. I, what I do you always, think of the idea? I want to ask you, you're in marketing, you're in branding. I, 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 I think there's a huge potential for, for coffee. Uh, there's one a coffee brand, and I always forget the name, but in, in the U.S. that targets uh, gun-loving uh, Americans. Uh, and they, in, I mean, <laughs> gun-loving Americans that are fed up with the high prices that Starbucks charges for yeah, the yeah, uh, yeah. hipster kind of coffee. And they're like contrarian. They don't want to be like that. And uh, they, they, they target that kind of person. They have that kind of person in mind. All of their marketing is just, geared towards that certain person and they're making all making a lot of money uh but i, I don't i don't remember the brand name but uh I, yeah I, yeah, I, yeah. They're, they're i mean huge. i did it a lot kind of to support the podcast uh mm -hmm. to be truthful uh because the podcast does cost a lot of money i mean you get into adobe creative suite that's like 52 bucks a month and then we need uh, vegas pro because my son sure. says that uh Adobe uh, Pro Premiere with Adobe is too complicated. He needs all the other ones, but for the video editing, he has to use Vegas Pro. That's what he learned on. So I have to get that. That's an extra. And then you get Zoom, and then you get into equipment and hosting and everything. And monthly cost is expensive, and YouTube ad revenue isn't the best. So I figured, mm -hmm. hey, I'm going to, you know, for merchandise, I'm already selling some merchandise, but I figured that I want to do coffee because I drink coffee. And yep. when I started investigating it, I'm, I was kind of like, well, you know what? Instead of just making Shark Bite Biz Coffee that's only going to appeal to people of my podcast, let's do Dead House Coffee because that'll appeal to my audience as well as a general audience altogether. And I, I don't know. I thought it was a runaway smash idea. I went out, made it a corporation the next day, and, and I'm off uh, running to the sales. So um, that's cool, though. Thanks for your uh, advice with that. And yeah, we're, you know, our guests know how the show works. I ask questions. Usually I use my life as an example. I have no shame whatsoever in that, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly. But 
that's because I think a lot of my audience are doing things that are very similar to how I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. And when I ask the questions, it's getting them the answers that they're looking for as well, too. So yeah. um, the next thing I wanted to talk about was with SEO. OK. Mm -hmm. And I did mention I did have a funny story for SEO for you as well, too. So I'll tell you the story and then let, let's dig into your knowledge. Knowledge. My whole life, David Strausser, I always ranked number one for, for SEO. OK. Then this one dweeb decides, hey, I'm going to become a doctor. And his name's also <laughs> David William Strasser. So Google, in their infinite wisdom, decided, you know what? This David Strasser that's always been number one, number two, all the way up through number 50, all of history, instantly this guy does, isn't worth anything. This guy, because he became Dr. David Strasser, is now worth all the SEO gold. So that, that created an issue for me, if you could imagine. Sure. So I, I've worked very, very, very hard. Uh, in fact, I started writing articles for places like Forbes, Forbes.com. Mm -hmm. I'm in, in their uh, business development council, and I have articles that are published with them. Worked very hard for SEO. I also found out that Dr. David Strausser did not buy drdavidstrausser.com. So I own drdavidstrausser.com. The guy uh, <laughs> as well? <laughs> yeah. I, well, the thing is, I might want to become a doctor one day. Sure. You know, yeah. A you doctor can, in business. You can be a doctor. Yeah. So I am reserving the right for my, my domain. Uh, you know, I went out. I did some very aggressive moves. I set myself up as a business for mm -hmm. Google My Business, for my name, David Strausser. And I actually bought a mailbox in the same town that this doctor is located. Oh, wow. So I have a local <laughs> office in Woodlands, Texas now because I bought a mailbox there. I have a P.O. box. So therefore, it is one of my. And I did all of these steps. And now for the most part, I say everybody's Google results are different. But I would yeah. say eight or nine out of 10, I'm either above him now or i'm right in the mix with him meaning that okay. maybe he's number one on number two is there anything else i could have done different i think i did a well, pretty good job yeah, yeah you went clearly you went all in uh, i'm i'm well my seo days are long gone i mean uh last six years i haven't really done any seo so okay. i'm not really up to date um but I, I, I think you've done a, a lot of efforts already. And if you're in that mix, if people know which David Strasser they're looking for, that's yeah, fine. Yeah, the they're one that's not a speed. dweeb. That's the one they're <laughs> looking for. Yeah, just put that in your in your title. The one not that's a not dweeb. a dweeb. Yep. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. I thought that um, you were more with the, uh, the SEO portion, but that's no problem. I still got a lot of other topics to talk so we already talked like a b testing okay yeah what about user testing okay explain to us what your definition of user testing is and how it's applicable yeah so user testing is you give a bunch of assignments to people uh, and they have to do them on your site and you just watch them do it and that I mean, that's like a very short version of, of explaining it. There's different ways of, of uh, approaching this. User testing on your own team. Oh, and you, you, so what you basically do is you, um, you give assignments, preferably to someone who matches your target audience. So uh, someone who loves zombies, for instance. Uh, right. You, uh, you, could, you can stop them in, in Starbucks, for instance, and because they're drinking coffee. And, and if mm -hmm. you ask people like, hey, do you like zombies? And they're like, yeah, yeah I'm a big fan of zombies. And they're like, do you have 10 minutes? Uh, I'll, I'll buy you a coffee. And then you sit them down <laughs> with your laptop and you just tell them like, hey, uh, do you want to go over the site and, and uh, give me some feedback? And uh, first of all, look at the site, five or 10 seconds, tell me what you think uh, we do what we sell, uh, why you should buy from us. Like that very first impression, what's, what's that about? And then uh, go, for, for instance, go to the product page. What, what, what do you think? Would you buy it? Would you not buy it? And that kind of feedback is, is essential. And it's, um, oh, yeah. it doesn't, I mean, there's different ways of doing that. You can 
uh, there's people who have a user testing lab and they invite their c consumers and, and they do it there. There's um, panels online that you can use and there's mm -hmm. platforms like user, userfeel and usertesting.com and that kind of stuff. Yeah, and I've seen a lot of those. And I think there's a lot of scam ones out there too, but there's a lot, there are a couple real ones out there. I've tested it just because uh, I wanted to see um, I'm trying to get my wife to make money somehow. So it, it's like, let me see if it's real. And I actually got like the, I think it was, uh, I, I didn't get paid cash for any of them, but I think one was like a hundred dollar Amazon gift card, for example. And it was yeah. totally legit, but I was in a panel for, uh, it was like 90 minutes or two hours or something like that. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I think the, the, yeah, the most common ones are usertesting.com. Uh, and they're usually, if you want to want someone to do a test, uh, it'll cost you, I don't know, about $60 or so, uh, maybe a little bit more, depends on the plan you're on. Um, but they go to, to your site, they complete the assignments that you give them, and then uh, they, ha they have to comment out loud. And that's the beauty of it. So you, you see them moving through your site and uh, saying stuff like, uh, I don't get this. Uh, why, why, why is that like this? Um, and it it even gets better um, when you ask them to do it, the same thing on your competitor's site. So you'll understand mm -hmm. it because usually people, when they're browsing, they compare sites. And um, uh, so that, yeah, that approaches uh, the most realistic experience. Uh, and then they'll say like, oh, I like this one. I like it because of this and this and this, or right. this is not clear here, but it's clear there. And so that comparison makes it so important and so strong and you'll get so many insights from it. So. Um, user testing, if you don't want to pay anything for it, you could do the Starbucks version I just told you as well. That, yeah, that'll give yeah. you some feedback as well. How many, I mean, how many people should you test, though, to have a real sample size? Well, the, the thing is, what a lot of people think of user testing like, oh, I should be drawing conclusions like 50% does this or 60% doesn't like that. That's not mm -hmm. the thing. It's, it's about qualitative research. Um, and usually what you'll have is uh, eight with eight testers, you'll have enough information uh, to like find the biggest roadblocks uh, they have uh, on their journey on a site. So eight people is usually mm -hmm. all it takes to find the most important uh, roadblocks. So and you could you could start with five. You'll already find a lot, but uh, five would be an absolute minimum. We typically do eight and anything above, you'll see the same things keep coming back and and uh, then it, it starts becoming a bit of a waste of time. So usually we find eight is a sweet spot, but if you just do five, that's that's already going to give you a lot of insights. Okay. So I'm going to be buying five uh, caramel fra uh, frappuccinos later today. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the last topic I want to talk to you about is going to be email marketing in mm -hmm. terms of e-commerce. I mean, again, I, I don't know if you know this, but we've got this pandemic that is going on and haven't heard of it email just it seems so old school with how a year and a half ago i don't think i would have said that but now i only get emails for work official communications like with my team everything else is done through microsoft teams everything else is done through a video call um, most of the emails that I get are going to be just like the unsolicited messages I get on LinkedIn. They're probably from somebody saying, hey, look, we're the best marketing agency in the world, but yet they're using a gmail.com address because they're too cheap to buy their own domain or, or inbox. True. And I don't know. I mean, a lot of the people I get, I, I, I just wrote an article on medium.com. Yeah. last week that's actually about cold calling cold prospecting in 2021 and some of the proper etiquette for that but I, I think you know a lot of the emails and messages that i get from a lot of these companies it just seems out of touch with the reality and they're not effective what's your take on this and how can you make it effective yeah, I think there's there's two things here. First one is is the the cold outreach kind of email, and the other one is where you've su subscribed to the list. And it, th those are two completely different worlds. Uh, okay. I think an e 
in e-commerce, uh, you should only email people that have subscribed to your list. So don't do any cold email outreach uh, if, if you're on an e-commerce. Um, the whole cold outreach thing, I think most of the people who do that, they go for quantity and not for quality. Um, I think just going yeah. for quality and trying to uh, adapt your message and make it very personal and not personal in a way like I use your first name, uh, that kind of stuff, but really show that you know what who that person is and and uh yeah, that you, that you understand maybe the world they live in and, and what they're doing, uh, that could already make a difference. And and even then, it's it's still a matter of emailing at the right time. You have that problem right. or not that they're writing you about, and then that could be that's always hit or miss. Um, I think email marketing when it comes to e-commerce, so people who have subscribed to to your list. That's still massive. And a lot of people think like email is dead. Uh, that's so 90s almost. Um, but it isn't. Um, I mean, we see it time and time again, like e-commerce companies that do 20, 25, 30, 35% of the revenue coming from email alone. Um, and you own that list. Whereas otherwise, you just have to pay Facebook or Google uh, to get that traffic. So and yeah, yeah. I mean, like for example, with Dead House Coffee, now I only have maybe about 50 or 60 names in there. Not all of them are customers. Some were from abandoned shopping carts, um, mm -hmm. which honestly, so you talk about like the user testing. I've reached out to every single abandoned shopping cart and found out why they didn't buy. That's awesome. Um, and in fact, one was like, well, because I only use PayPal, your site doesn't have PayPal. I'm like, yes, I do accept PayPal. And I went and I looked and somehow Shopify got disconnected from my PayPal. So I had to reconnect it. And then I sent him a screenshot. Yep, go through here. It's connected. 10 minutes later, I had a $75 order. So, yep. um, you know, that that that's something I did do. But should I be... Uh, sending to because I view those as different. There are people that have given me their information, whether they completed the purchase or not. They put their emails in there. And should I be communicating? Should I be emailing those people like, "Hey, look, we just launched our brand new zombie theme site. Come check it out. You know, and we'll give you ten percent off with the code zombie. You know, things like that. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I think there's. Uh, two things that you should be doing with email marketing for e-commerce. I think you need uh, flows or automations that are set up. So that really mm -hmm. uh, gets triggered um, depending on the behavior they're doing. So if they just right. sign up, send them a welcome email series. Um, if they abandon the cart, you send them a separate email series where uh, you try to recover that. Um, could also be when they uh, br browse abandonment. That's another one, for instance. But then there's... Um, uh, the the other thing is the campaigns, and the campaigns is really when you have a ten percent off, for instance, or an e well Easter sale or a Christmas. I sale. always have ten percent off. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's like around sales events that you should be running, like every four to six weeks, because uh, it, okay. it'll always give a boost to your uh, yeah to your sales numbers. So uh, I I probably run every four to six weeks a sales event, uh, and that's. Really depends a bit on the calendar. So around Black Friday, obviously you're going to do a Black Friday promotion. Um, but other than that, you have those automations set up, and that's it's quite a bit of work in the beginning. But once you have them set up, they make your money yeah. in the background. Just My like day that. job, I do ERP with Vision Thirty Three, and mm -hmm. it's for small to mid-sized businesses. We focus with uh, people like me, like ecom. You know, that make or move a product. We do the SAP Business One. Uh, with people that are, you know, going to be professional services, software companies, SaaS companies, things like that, agencies like yourself. That's where we go with the Sage Intact. But my day job, everything is all about, um, all about automations and setting up process, automated process workflows, all that stuff. And that's mm -hmm. one of the things that when I was considering about launching this i'm like well i have me i have my wife who doesn't speak english and then i have my 17 year old almost 18 year old in a couple weeks here uh son that uh also produces the podcast how can i utilize the three of us to make this um to make this work and it was like 
automation. Now, the other thing is, and we've learned this from a lot of our guests on the show, is that you have to automate to a degree because if you yeah. over automate, then it's just going to be generic and it's going to have the reverse effect. Sure. So I do have some basic automations built in, like, for example, abandoned shopping cart. If you don't complete it, uh, yep. it's going to email you in 24 hours if you provided an email. Um, I think it might text also if you gave a phone number and not an email. Mm. So things like that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's the best starting point. Uh, abandoned cart, usually that's where we see the, the biggest conversion uh, numbers. Uh, but just don't stop at one email. Um, usually two to three emails is, is the, the minimum Ooh. that you should be sending. Yeah. So, and, and the first one is what you did manually is perfect. Like sending an email and saying, hey, uh, I noticed you left something in, in the cart. Um, can we help you? Just something very supportive. Uh, don't well, try. It, it wasn't oh. even that. What I sent to him was like, hey, look, we're a brand new business. We mm -hmm. just launched family owned business, um, you know, all that good stuff. Um, I'm not asking you to buy. OK, just tell me why you didn't buy and yep. help me understand. So that way, next time I can get the person to buy. And it was actually it, it surprised me like your PayPal. What? What do you mean? PayPal's not working. And I fix it. And all of a sudden I get the sale. Now, there was another woman. I did it, too. This was the first abandoned shopping cart. So I didn't actually reach out to her uh, initially. Uh, she was ordering, I think, just like, you know, the Keurig cups. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's cheap. I think they're like 12 bucks or 14 bucks in the site. My cost is like seven bucks, I think. So it was like, you know what? I'm just going to buy those myself for her. Send it because I already had the full name, address, phone number, email. Okay. And then I just attached a note to it being like, hey, look, we just launched. This is in the first 24 hours. You were the first person that didn't buy. Here's the free coffee. Just do me a favor. Tell me why you didn't buy. And um, like she wrote back, like she was the happiest person ever over that. And she was like, you know, I didn't buy. My husband distracted me and then I forgot. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that happens a lot, I guess. It's, it's hard to quantify that, but I can imagine it happens a lot. But uh, it's, it's a great move there. I mean, uh, just doing that, reaching out proactively and showing that you care, uh, that's probably going to be a fan for life because uh, no one else does that. And that's the, the beauty of what you're doing the right now. The personal touch. I, I, yeah, I, I strive sure in personal relationships, yep. you know? Like you and me, now that we've met, you, we're going to be best friends. You're going to be calling me yeah. up drunk next weekend, you know, <laughs> telling me your life story, crying to me on the phone. That's what I do to people. I can't help it. I'll take you up on that offer next weekend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, hey, we do got to get going. I think we talked about a lot of topics, and I appreciate you allowing me to use uh, my real life stuff as some examples for the audience. Um, I, I want to end with one final question, okay? Google Analytics. My take on Google Analytics is, is that it's the gold standard, unfortunately, but, you know, just because it is the gold standard and it's free doesn't mean that it's always the best. But put that, put that aside for a second. Everybody pretty much uses Google Analytics. What do you think some of the most common mistakes they make with that platform? Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I totally, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm with you on that. I mean, Google yeah. Analytics, unfortunately, we, uh, we're we stuck with it. I, although it's still a great tool. I mean, you can, you can, oh, yeah. still, you can do a lot with it. However, I think the, the biggest mistake people make um, is they, um, they don't, look at actionable data they they look at data and they're like oh people spend two minutes and 15 seconds on my seconds on my site so what i mean what can you actually do with that so there's there's not a shortage of of data but there's a, a shortage of insights with google analytics and mm -hmm. uh, you can you can produce a lot of data with it but if you cannot use those data to actually improve your marketing or your website then don't use them then don't look at them. And I think most people get stuck and hung up on on, on data that you can act, not actually use to uh, to improve your site or your or your marketing. 
Now, I, I could be wrong, but I think a lot of companies like you, the value that you bring, maybe a company has enough people to do marketing and all that good type of stuff. Okay, maybe they do have good creatives that that they're making. What they don't have is somebody that's actually able to take the raw data from, you know, whether it's Google Analytics or whatever they're using and turn it into actual useful, actionable information. And I think that's what an agency like Dexter Agency really strives at. That That's the key because that's where you're filling in the gap. You may have killer people that can make viral memes for your social media team, but is it adding into conversions? And that's where the agency fills that gap. Do you think that's pretty accurate? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, there's no shortage of, of data. There's a, a shortage of, of insights. And um, you could just got to m- make sense out of all that those data. And w- one thing I, I see happen a lot is people look at Google Analytics data, and it's not just about how can I use that, but it's also they try to uh, understand why something is happening, but you cannot answer that question uh, in, in Google Analytics. Uh, Google Analytics is all about where is it happening? Um, and, and the why is something you have to answer with, for instance, user testing. So you could see, oh, a lot of people are jumping off at this particular step in the process, but why is that? If you keep looking at Google Analytics, you will not find the answer. Uh, you, you only understand where it is, and then you'll have to understand the why uh, from another uh, research method. So um, that's another common mistake I see with, with Google Analytics, is, is really trying to uh, draw conclusions from data that you cannot actually you cannot actually draw those conclusions because uh, the why is usually not in Google Analytics for most uh, answers that you, uh, questions that you're trying to answer. Okay, okay, hey, and uh, we cannot leave here without talking about your your book. Uh, I've got to say I am impressed because you found the way to get the word killed twice in the title. <laughs> <laughs> why don't you Good tell us about the book? Yeah, yeah, we should. Yeah, we should do a pack with that uh, with your coffee. Uh, oh, there you go. Kill the zombies. Uh, That's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the, the the book is called "Kill Your Conversion Killers." Uh, so basically, that's that's what we do. A lot of websites they have conversion killers, and we we kill them. Uh, we try to find a solution for that. And the book is is reads more like a step by step manual for uh, e commerce companies who want to do that themselves. Um, so I I really try to condense all my uh, yeah, all my experience in, in, in that book and, and make it not too high level in a way that people want to show off how intelligent they are, but I really right. want to make hands-on um, and pragmatic. Okay, okay. Yeah, no, that, that's awesome. Where can they get the book? So, yeah, you can pay for it on Amazon uh, for sure, but if you want to uh, get a, a free copy, you can download a free PDF on dexo.agency slash free dash book, uh, and you can download a free PDF version there. Every everybody that watches, listens to the show, doesn't matter if you're on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, or any of the other billion podcast apps out there, scroll down in the description. Uh, I know, I know there's a million links in there for all the different things, places you can find the podcast, but I always put the the links for guests like yours here they're always up top right underneath the introduction you'll find the link how to find him how to find his book how to get his ebook um also how can they reach out to you if you yeah, want some digital act- stalkers <laughs> I, i'm pretty active on linkedin so you can uh, you can add me on linkedin um or otherwise you can just email me yours at texto.agency Okay, perfect. We'll get all that down there. Hey, yours, thank you so much, man. This has been amazing. Yeah, it was great being here, David. You have fun? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> there we go. Grab the bed himself. Thank you so much. And, you know, maybe once a couple months after the pandemic ends, if it ever does end, a quarter, maybe two quarters after it ends, I want to bring you back on so that we can talk about how things are different then compared to how they are now and do a comparison of how everything's evolving once we get back to quote unquote normal life. Awesome. Yeah. And in the meantime, I'll call you when I'm drunk. Hey, text me too. I love (laughs) drunk (laughs) texts. Thank you. Oh, wow. That was an awesome chat with yours, right? 
First, y'all know the routine if you found this interview helpful. If it sparked those warm and fuzzies, do me a favor. Hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, follow button, whatever it says. Doesn't matter if you're on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Deezer, Stitcher, anywhere out there, follow the show. We are a group of like-minded individuals looking for personal growth, professional growth, business growth. Keyword, all three of those, growth. This is a show for growth to help you break through the barriers preventing your growth, okay? So join the community, be active, but if you really want to do us a solid, share this video out, get it out there, help people find out who Shark Bite Fizz is. We bring you two awesome interviews each and every week, every Monday and Thursday at 6 a.m. Eastern with awesome individuals like yours. Share this interview out. I'd love nothing more than to see Shark Bite Biz and the Dexter Agency out there trending on Twitter. Now, let's get back to our rock star guest, yours. First, loved it. Yeah, and I, I got to call this out, okay? I did not get this. I, I was recording my intro, and then on top of the intro, I rewatched the video, stuff like that. And it was like, I'm looking at the book, and... I, I see the title and the titles kill your conversion killers. And then I'm looking down bottom on the book and it says with the Dexter method. And then I'm looking at his name and I was thinking, wait a second, the Dexter method, he's the Dexter agency. And then it just hit me. Yoris is a huge fan of the TV show Dexter. <laughs> that is awesome. Bam. I mean, they just like, uh, car crash right into my brain like i got it and that is awesome that's a really clever and fun way to kind of be playing off that especially if you're i'm assuming a super fan dexter is uh well yours is a super fan of dexter so well done on that yours love it that's awesome i bet nobody is more excited than you about the new season of dexter coming out i telling you i can't wait for it that's awesome now let's get back to our conversation we had I think one of the first things that you know, yours was saying that is extremely important is that freelancers do not charge enough. And that is so true. I go back to my days while I was freelancing, and I really think I should have charged more. The economy was way different back then, but still, too often people undervalue their work. As I was thinking about this after our interview, you know, like if I'm selling, I don't know, I have a... Google Stadia controller right here, okay? It, this retails, I guess, the controller alone about 80 bucks. So if I was going to be selling that controller, optimally, I would want to buy it at 40 bucks if I want to sell it at 80 bucks, okay? Maybe a little bit more, make smaller margin, but we're talking in a perfect world optimal. That should be the same thing for your consulting work, okay? If you're figuring out how my, you have to figure out like, okay, I want to earn a salary of X per week. Okay. And that's where you should figure that salary off of 20 hours worth of work or the lowest amount of possible that you can. And, you know, really hearing you say that and the way that he broke it down I found that to be really intriguing, refreshing. I wish I would have had that piece of info before I started my current job here with Vision 33. It would have changed my life a couple of years ago because I think if I would have had that piece of info and thought about it that way, I could have done so much more. I could have saved myself countless amount of hours if I had operated differently. Again, the economy was different back then, so... Hey, I'm not going to dread on the past, but I will keep that in mind going on in the future, and you should too. Now, the next thing he brought up was 10x. The service guarantee that he gives to his client is that he is going to generate 10 times what they pay him, okay? If not, then this is what he said, okay? He will be working for free until he does. That's, a, that's huge. That's a big, big commitment. And I think a lot of times in companies, marketing agencies, ad agencies, stuff like that, they talk big. You hear about their successes, 
But when there's failures, you don't hear about it. It's just kind of like you pay about it and you, they go their way. We go our way. And here you have a company like yours is that, you know, essentially guarantees you like, hey, we'll work for free till we generate 10 times that return if you do the A-B testing. I mean, that that's awesome. I wish more service companies would work like that because I, I think that marketing, and this gets into my last bullet point here, but with marketing, I think that's one of the areas that a lot of companies really, they don't spend enough money on. They don't put the right resources. They look to be as cheap as possible. And if you have companies that are meant to help them grow and they're able to quantify that, like, hey, look, you're going to spend $2,000 a month with us, plus your ad buys of maybe $20,000, okay? So $22,000 to $25,000 a month, you know? And then out of that, we're going to get you returns, you know, $100,000, $200,000, whatever. You know, if you're able to quantify that in some kind of guarantee, I think that's awesome. I think that would get companies to spend more money because they feel like they're going to have a safety net. Now, do you have to do 10 times? No, I, I think 10 times to me sounds high. But hey, with Dexter's agency, with yours's company, the size of the ads that they're doing, the type of clientele that they do, that's what he's tracking. And a lot of that is, you got to remember, these marketing agencies, they're not hiring creative people as much. They're more hiring data analysts because we're in a digital first world. So they're able to follow the cookie crumb trails of people on the internet and get highly precise marketing to them by following the data, not by having ads that stick out like a sore thumb. And that is where we go into the last topic, which is the A-B testing is probably something that isn't used as much. And it's more, I think companies should invest more time, more money into doing A-B testing. Marketing, again, I said this earlier, but it's the budget that companies love to cut first. I just don't get that. I mean, they think, oh, we're not going to cut sales. I would rather cut sales and have less sales where reps because I, I think commissioned sales reps or, you know, if, even if it's just like um, a salary plus commission, full commission, whatever, I, I think very few of them would complain, oh, you're giving me too much leads. I'm making too much money. Less sales reps for a lot of companies probably wouldn't impact the salespeople negatively. I don't know. It depends on the company industry. Um, but they're not going to complain for the opportunity to make more money. So I'd say focus that money more on lead demand, uh, on marketing. And if you're investing the money in something like A-B testing, you're going to find out what works out of multiple options instead of you trying to say, hey, this is what I think our customers want to see. I think our customers will find this attractive and then throwing all your eggs in one basket. If you go through that and fine tune it with some solid A, B testing. And remember, A, B testing doesn't mean you have just option A and option B. I mean, you could do 50 options if you need to but it's going to broaden your horizons. You're gonna be able to test your product, test your message, test your service. And again, I can't stress this enough. It'll allow you to follow the data to the pot of gold that you'll find at the end of the rainbow. Hey, his book is Kill Your Conversion Killers. Grab it, I believe it's at Amazon. We're gonna have the link below down in the description. Make sure you check this out. It is a wonderful book. I've been skimming through it. I have a big pile of books from all the awesome people that have been on this show. Uh, so it is something that uh, I'm going to get to, and I'll give you a full analysis of it later. But check it out. Question of the day. Have you ever done A-B testing? And if you have, what was your experience? Leave a comment down below on YouTube or any of the podcast channels that you're watching us. Remember, Sharkbite Biz has our own app. We have an app on the Android store. Go check it out. Just search in the Play Store. 
uh, Shark Bite Biz. You'll find it amazing. Has all the podcast info right there. Lastly, you want to be on the show? If so, shoot me an email. Interviews at sharkbitebiz.com. Lastly, don't forget, join the channel. $3 a month. You can become a baby shark. Or go to deadhousecoffee.com. Use code SHARK at 20% off of your purchase as well as it directly supports this channel. And you all know this by now. I'm David Strasser. This is Shark by Fizz. We'll see you all next episode. Cheers. Thank you for listening to Shark by Fizz. We hope you got some insightful info from this podcast. Be sure to subscribe to us through your favorite podcast app and visit us on the web at www.sharkbitebiz.com. How has business changed for you in the 20s? Email us at podcast at sharkbitebiz.com so you can join us and share your story. 